Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fullerton, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about magnetism, specifically talking about moving charges in magnetic fields. Our objectives are going to be to calculate the magnitude and direction of the magnetic force on moving charges in terms of charge, velocity, and magnetic field strength, and explain why the magnetic force can perform no work. Secondly, deduce the direction of a magnetic field from information about the forces experienced by charged particles moving through the field. Derive and apply the formula for the radius of the circular path of a charge that moves perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field. And finally, to describe under what conditions particles will move with constant velocity through crossed magnetic and electric fields. So let's start by talking about magnetism. Magnetism is a force caused by moving charges. Magnets are dipoles. They have a north and a south. You can't find a north without a south. The theory of magnetic monopoles, having a north all by itself or a south all by itself, we just haven't found any yet. They don't exist in nature. Like poles repel and opposite poles attract. And magnetic domains are clusters of atoms with electrons spinning in the same direction. Kind of a simplified version of thinking about that. But if you have random domains, random net magnetic fields, you have no overall magnetic field. If, however, the domains are organized so they're all lining up in basically the same direction, you get a net magnetic field. The electrons are, to some extent, spinning in the same direction might be one way to think about it. Again, a simplified version, but I think you get the general idea. So, magnetic field strength, capital B, is a vector quantity. The units are Tesla, where one Tesla is a newton second per coulomb meter, and that's a very strong magnetic field. So a more common non-SI unit is the Gauss, where one Gauss is about 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. And the Earth's magnetic field strength, to give you a flavor, is about half a Gauss. Now, magnetic field lines make closed loops and run from north to south outside the magnet, and they run from south to north inside the magnet as they make a closed loop. They show the direction the north pole of a magnet would tend to point if it was placed in a magnetic field. So compasses or other magnets line up with the net magnetic field. The density of the magnetic field is known as the magnetic flux, phi. Now because we're going to be dealing with fields and forces in three dimensions, how we're going to deal with that is if we have something coming out of the plane of the page, it would look kind of like this, as if you have the point of an arrow coming toward you. That's out of the page. If it were going into the plane of the page, into the plane of the screen, you would see the fletchings on the arrow, so you have an X as if the arrow was going away from you. That would be into the plane of the page or the screen. Now let's talk about compasses for just a minute. The Earth is a giant magnet, and the Earth's magnetic north pole is located near the geographic south pole, and vice versa. So a compass's north magnetic pole points toward the Earth's magnetic south pole, the geographic north. And a compass lines up with the net magnetic field. Now in actuality, the magnetic north and south pole of the Earth are constantly moving. The current rate of change of magnetic north is thought to be more than 20 kilometers per year. It is believed that the magnetic north pole has shifted more than 1,000 kilometers since it was first reached by explorer Sir John Ross back in 1831. Interesting facts. So let's get into the forces on moving charges. The magnetic force is always perpendicular to the charged object's velocity. Therefore, the magnetic force on a moving charge is never applied in the direction of, of the displacement. Therefore, a magnetic force can do no work on a moving charge. It can change its direction, however. The magnetic force, Fm, or sometimes written Fb, is the charge times the velocity vector crossed with the magnetic field vector where the magnitude, fm, is qvb sine theta, where theta is the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field strength vector. So in this case, let's assume that we have the magnetic field pointing out of the screen toward us. If you take your right hand, point it in the direction of the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the velocity, bend them in the direction of the magnetic field out of the plane of the screen, your thumb should point in the direction of the force, or in this direction. 
If this were a negative charge instead of a positive charge, however, you would use the left hand rule. Point the fingers of your left hand in the direction of the negative particle's velocity. Bend them in the direction of the net magnetic field and your thumb would point in the direction of the force. In this case, that would be if it were a negative charge in that direction. The other thing to look at here is that if the strength of the magnetic field, the magnitude of the magnetic field strength is QVB sine theta, and the magnetic field is perpendicular to the velocity, sine theta is sine 90 degrees or one, that just becomes QVB. So, if the magnetic force cannot perform work on a moving charge, it can change its direction, moving it in a circle if the magnetic force is constant. So just expanding our diagram from the previous page, you can have an object moving in this circular path. In this case, the magnetic force is also what's causing the centripetal force, causing it to move in a circle. So we could say that QVB, because sine theta is sine 90 or one, degree, or, uh, one equals MV squared over R. Therefore, the radius is going to be MV over QB. And note here that MV is just the momentum of your particle. So the total force on a moving charged particle, well, the electric field can do work on a moving charge. The magnetic field can never do work on a moving charge, but you get both of these forces when you have a moving charge. So we call that total force the Lorentz force, where the total force is equal to Q times the electric field. Remember, QE is the electric force plus V cross B. Or you could expand that out to say that that's QE plus QV cross B, where this is the electric force and this is the magnetic force. It's known as the Lorentz force when we put them together. And an interesting application of this is the velocity selector apparatus. If we have a charged particle in crossed electric and magnetic fields, it can undergo constant velocity motion if the velocity, the magnetic field strength, and the electric field strength are all selected perpendicular to each other. They're at just the right settings. If the velocity equals E divided by B, the particle can travel directly through the selector without any deflection, while particles with any other velocity are deflected off one way or another. How that works, the electric force must equal the magnetic force, or QE equals QV cross B. And again, assuming that those are perpendicular, we'll just look at their magnitudes, QE equals QVB, or V equals E divided by B. If that's the case, the electric, the electric force and the magnetic force are exactly balanced. The particle travels through undeflected. So let's take a look at a couple sample problems here. A charge of five microcoulombs moves with the velocity of five times 10 to the six meters per second in the X direction. Find the force on the charge due to a magnetic field of half Tesla in the positive Y direction. So let's start with our givens. Q, our charge is five times 10 to the minus six coulombs. Our velocity is five million meters per second. And our magnetic field strength is 0 0.5 Tesla in the J hat direction. And I should point out that this is in the X direction, so I hat. Well, the magnetic force, I'm gonna write that as FB this time is Q times V cross B. Where in this case, this is going to be QVB sine theta if we're just after its magnitude. And theta here is 90 degrees. Therefore, sine theta equals one. We can just say that the magnetic force equals QVB. All right, let's substitute in our values. This implies then that the magnetic force is five times 10 to the minus six coulombs times our velocity, five times 10 to the sixth meters per second times our magnetic field strength is 0.5 Tesla. So our 10 to the minus six, 10 to the six will cancel out. Five times five is 25 and half of that will give us 
12.5 newtons. Great. Let's try another one. A proton moves in a circular orbit of radius half a meter perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field of magnitude 0.3 Tesla. Find the period and frequency of the proton's orbit as well as its speed. Well, let's draw a little quick diagram here. There's our proton in orbit. We'll give it a radius of half a meter. At some point here, it has a velocity perpendicular to that radius line. And we know that we have a magnetic field coming out of the page at us equal to 0 0.3 Tesla. All right. Well, the first thing I'm going to look at is if this is moving in a circle, the centripetal force must be equal to the magnetic force on the particle. Therefore, we could say that centripetal force, which is mv squared over r, must be equal to qvb sine theta. And again, sine theta, sine 90 degrees, is going to be 1. Let's rearrange this to get the velocity on one side. So v squared over v is going to be equal to qrb divided by the mass. We can v squared over v is just going to be velocity. Therefore, velocity is equal to our charge. Charge on a proton is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times our radius, 0 0.5 meters. Our magnetic field strength, b, 0 0.3 tesla divided by the mass of a proton, right around 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And when I put all that into my calculator, I come up with a velocity of about 1.44 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. And we'll neglect any relativistic effects here in this problem. Now, if we want to figure out what its period and frequency are, well, if it's moving in a circle, that's one circumference. So if velocity is distance traveled divided by time, then the time to go once around is the distance divided by the velocity, or 2 pi r, one circumference divided by the velocity, which is 2 pi times our radius 0.5 meters over 1.44 times 10 to the seventh meters per second, which gives me a period of about 2.18 times 10 to the minus seven seconds. And once I have period, then frequency is pretty straightforward. Frequency is just one divided by the period, or one divided by 2.18 times 10 to the minus seven seconds which is going to give me about 4.58 times 10 to the sixth, one over seconds, or hertz, which I'm going to write as 4.58 megahertz. Okay, let's do one more here. Find the speed of a charged particle which passes through a velocity selector with magnetic field strength of one tesla perpendicular to an electric field of 600,000 newtons per coulomb. Well, in this case, the electric force must be equal to the magnetic force for it to pass through undeflected. Therefore, QE equals QVB sine theta, which is going to be 1 again since they're perpendicular. Sine 90 degrees is 1. Therefore, the velocity is the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength or 600,000 newtons per coulomb divided by one tesla, which will give us 600,000 meters per second. Hopefully that gets you a good start with moving charges in magnetic fields. If you need more help or looking for more information, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks everyone and make it a great day.